So um, right now we've got Michelle Nichols with us. She's from the Adler Planetarium and she's our favorite astro educator. Uh, please welcome Michelle Nichols, looking for Earth elsewhere. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So I will address one question that just popped up. So um, hello to Bob Kaplow. Um, yes, I am still at the Adler. Several of you may have heard um, that uh, we unfortunately uh, suffered from the uh, 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 COVID pandemic uh, closures. So um, we, we had a, a round of layoffs in, um, uh, in May. So uh, it's going to be quite a while before the Adler opens. We're taking a very conservative approach to, um, to safety and uh, making sure that all the personal protection equipment are, is available to the doctors and nurses and first responders that need them. So we're going to be closed. We're going to concentrate on digital offerings, so online stuff. Um, and so look out for that stuff uh, over the coming months. It, like I said, it may be quite a while before the Adler is open. We're prepared to be closed for... Um, possibly the next year and a half. So um, it's, it's going to be a while. Anyway, don't worry. We're, we're okay for now. And um, just keep an eye out for some online stuff. Check our social media feeds. Uh, we're at Adler Planet on Instagram and Twitter and Adler Planetarium on Facebook. Now, one other thing is I do these programs completely separate from my job. Um, this is this is something I like to do because I love talking with audiences, uh, especially at libraries. You guys are my favorite audiences out there, and um, I love coming to Bloomingdale. I just wish I could be with you guys in person, but um, again, stay safe out there, um, and uh, I hope everyone is staying cool in this weather. So, um, all right, we're going to talk about looking for Earth Elsewhere. What I meant by that when I came up with that title was looking for Earth-like planets. It is not as easy as it sounds. Looking for something out there in space um, uh, that is Earth-like, it, it, it's not enough just to be Earth-sized. There are a whole lot of other things that we need to look for for something to be Earth-like. But um, one, one thing we can talk about is how we're searching for these planets to begin with. Um, so I'm going to, let's see. Oh, Christina, uh, yeah. I need to be able to share my screen. So um, if you could gotcha. work on that, that'd be fantastic. Gotcha. The little green button shows up, but it's up. Uh, there we go. All right. It. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And can you see just my slide, not my participant, not my uh, presenter notes? I can see only your slide. Excellent. All right. It's fantastic when the technology works. Okay. So um, how this is going to work is I'm going to do some slides, run through some. I'll stop. I'll look for questions in the chat. Um, so as we go along, please put your questions in the chat so that um, we only have to go back a few slides if, uh, if you have a particular question. Okay. So looking for Earth elsewhere. We're looking for planets around other stars. And um, the typical idea of solar system is this, right? We've got a sun, we've got a one star in our solar system called our sun, and we've got eight or nine planets. I say nine, actually, there's probably even way more than that. Um, yes, I consider Pluto a planet, and uh, it's totally okay if you do or don't. And so you think of some planets, and you got some big ones and some small ones. Unfortunately, this graphic is um, wildly... Um, inaccurate in terms of the sizes of planets in our solar system, especially compared to our sun. Uh, so do not take this graphic for size nor distance. Um, and the planets are also not to scale with each other. However, um, like I said, you think solar system, you think some planets and some and a star and some comets and some asteroids and moons and other stuff. So um, what we're looking for out there is essentially trying to find an Earth, trying to find a place out there elsewhere that could potentially host life. Um, that would be something that that would be kind of the holy grail to find is actually evidence of life around another star, but um, we need to find some planets first. So um, first off, let's go through some terms just to get us all on the same page. We live in 
a galaxy. This galaxy is called the Milky Way. This is a galaxy similar to our own. We can't get outside of our Milky Way and take a picture of it. Um, but this is what we think if we, we take a look at our galaxy and we kind of go, okay, let's look around and find one that we think kind of looks like ours. And this one kind of looks like ours. Um, now, if there are any, and I know there's at least one Star Trek fan out there, especially the original series, um, uh, back in the first season of Star Trek, um, there was a, a, a quote that, uh, if you're familiar with the characters of Star Trek, you've got the Doctor, um, McCoy, said to Captain Kirk, quote, in this galaxy of ours, there are three million Earth-type planets. Um, he, he almost had it right. He was off by a few zeros, however. We think there are literally billions of planets out there around other stars. Now, we have not found billions. We've found quite a few. Um, and I'm going to go through the, the, a little bit of the history of that. But in fact, we think about 70 to 90 percent of all stars out there have at least one planet. And that's just based on the, on the stars we've searched so far. Uh, that that percentage holds true. Large planets are fairly rare. Um, small planets seem to be a lot more abundant. Um, there seems to be uh, many more stars that have multiple planets around them. And we think there could be over a hundred million Earth-like planets that exist. Now, how many of those have we found? Zero. We know of one. That is the one planet that you're currently sitting or standing on, and that is Earth. Um, but let's talk about how we, how you even get planets in the first place. How we, how we have known you actually get planets around stars, and then how we search for those planets. All right. So, planets. Um, and, and having them form around stars, it all depends on location, location, location. This is a real object. This almost looks like um, an object that's sort of a composite between several, but no, this is real. Um, this is a, a group of stars. You can see that uh, sort of clustered group. We call that a cluster. Um, and then all that wispy stuff is dust and gas. Usually in these sorts of cloudy things, we call them nebulae or nebula, which is just the Latin word that means cloud, because when early astronomers saw these things, either with their eyes or uh, through telescopes, they went, oh, they're fuzzy like clouds, and they called them all nebula. It doesn't mean they're all the same thing. We use the word nebula to describe many different things, but this is a nebula where stars are forming, and stars form in, usually in big groups. Over time, you may or may not get dusty disks of stuff forming around stars. We think that, that those dusty disks may be pretty common, but when I mention location, 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 depending on where the star might be in relation to other stars, if there are a lot of big stars nearby and the, the um, environment that these stars are in might be pretty harsh, you may not get planets that form or maybe life wouldn't have a chance to take a foothold uh, on those planets. But basically, stars form in big giant clouds of gas and dust. They form in groups. You have dusty disks around the stars, maybe. And then planets form because of those dusty disks. That stuff starts clumping together and sticking together very gently over time. And that's how we think planets are formed. Um, this, by the way, is called the Orion Nebula. It's the uh, fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion. So he is visible in the uh, wintertime sky. Now, this is an artist's rendition. The last two pictures were actual pictures. Um, this is an artist's rendition. I'm just giving you a sense of a star in the middle and the dusty disk. Um, around it and then again the stuff will kind of stick together over time and so then do you have the opportunity to form planets maybe um, what sizes are those planets it could be many different sizes could be many planets could be one could be none um, so we seem to find a variety of solar systems out there variety is the key now this is kind of your classic Goldilocks graphic uh, in terms of why you might get a, a planet that could be Earth-like out there. This is called the habitable zone, meaning you're not too close to your star where you're gonna to be too hot. You're not gonna to be too far from your star where you might be too cold. 
this is not the end all be all of why you might get planets that might host life around them. This habitable zone, you, it, isn't, um, it isn't a hard and fast rule about this habitable zone. Planets may be within a habitable zone, but maybe the star itself is pretty harsh. Um, maybe the planet is within the habitable zone, but it's too big or it's too small or it doesn't have any air or there are a variety of things that can, that can happen that might make a planet. It could be within this Goldilocks zone, but the planet itself might not be able to host life. So just being within the habitable zone is not enough um, to make you uh, be a habitable planet. You got to be the right size. You have to have a star that isn't going to uh, uh, lay waste to your surface with a lot of radiation. Um, you have to have the right amount of gravity. You have to have some air. You have to have some water. You got to be the right temperature. You have to have all sorts of things that you got to have a rocky surface. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that have to go into the mix in order to make a habitable planet. Now in 1995, um, so basically about a month after I started working at the Adler, um, the, the announcement of the first discovery of a planet around another star um, that was kind of similar to our sun. Um, it's called 51 Pegasi B. Um, this, this planet actually has a real name. It is called Dimidium. I must admit, I can't remember what Dimidium means. So if someone wants to look that up and throw it in the chat, that would be really helpful. I realize I, I put the name in there and I completely forgot to check uh, what the name means. Um, anyway, uh, this planet orbits its star in four days, four Earth days. Let's put that into perspective. It is Monday night. So Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night at about six o'clock or so, this planet will have orbited its star once. Its year is four Earth days long. This planet is roasting. It is really close to its star. There is basically zero chance of life existing on this planet. Um, so, but hey, we found a planet. That's pretty cool if you ask me. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. I want to uh, see if there are any questions in the chat. All right. Let me check. All right. Oh, thank you, Sid. Thanks for, for clarifying that. And he was a doctor, not an explorer. Sid, I like you. I don't know who you are, but I like you. Um, all right. Are all the small planets mostly rocky? Not necessarily. Um, they, they can be, and it, it just depends. Our, um, it depends on your definition of small. Um, if it's about one to two times this, maybe one to one and a half to two times the size of the Earth, yeah, they're going to have rocky surfaces, anything really much bigger than that. And you might have a rocky surface, but you're going to have uh, a nasty atmosphere. And so, um, uh, and say, so why a disk as opposed to a sphere? Oh, um, so basically these clouds start off as clouds gravity starts pulling them together they start spinning and just and they start flattening the clouds around or the disk around the star starts flattening so it may have started off kind of more spherical but as it starts spinning um, then it will flatten and so that's why a disk so it started off as more of a cloudy lump um, but it ended up as a disk so great question okay so I think we're good in terms of the chat. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. So keep, keep sending those questions. I love those questions. All right. OK. So um, we call these planets around other stars exoplanets. So we have planets in our solar system. Exoplanets are planets around other stars. And the, the ones that we have found, for the most part, this graphic needs to be updated. Um, but the, generally, they're about this far from our, um, uh, from our solar system. We're about 2 thirds of the way out from the center of the Milky Way. Um, and so we found them in, within a few thousand uh, light years. Let me uh, clarify what a light year is. A light year is a term of distance. It is not a term of time. It sounds like time, but it's not. It is the distance light travels in a year. Um, so it comes out to about 6.6, .6, almost 7 trillion miles. Sorry, 
6.6? Yeah, 6.6 .6 trillion miles. And so because that number of zeros gets really big, really fast, that's why we use the term light year. So we are about 25,000 light years or so from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And the planets that we found around our solar system generally um, fall within a few thousand light years of our solar system. And then this cone right here refers to the, uh, the direction that the Kepler spacecraft was staring at for about four years. So it was staring in this specific direction. And so the planets that it found are within that cone. Um, and then there's a few others. Uh, I'm not gonna go into to, to these in particular, but um, generally, we found them in a roughly spherical direction, kind of, um, with that extra cone uh, being the direction that the Kepler spacecraft stared at for four years. Now, we have other spacecraft and telescopes that have looked at uh, or looked for planets. Now, the Kepler is the most famous um, planet hunter. TESS, the, transit, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, is up there right now, and it's doing its job, doing great work. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope doesn't necessarily search for planets, but it is involved with a lot of follow-up work. Um, and uh, you might find a planet using another telescope, and so Hubble might, might do some follow-up uh, um, determination as to whether or not that planet is actually really there, or might, might find out a bit more about it. We've got some ground-based observatories. That picture right there is of the Keck uh, 1 and Keck 2 telescopes in Hawaii. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope has been retired, but it was used um, to, uh, to do some follow-up work for planets as well. The James Webb Space Telescope um, is, it was supposed to have launched by now. It's probably going to be a few more years before it launched because lo and behold, you build the telescope the size of a tennis court, it's kind of hard. Um, to test it and build it. So uh, it is just a difficult spacecraft to build. Um, and so we've got a few others that are that are uh, coming on uh, down the line. So anyway, these are the main telescopes and spacecraft that are looking for uh, planets around other stars. Um, I wanted to bring up this slide. I change this slide every single time I do this talk. Um, this is a screenshot of the a website and if you remember nothing of what I say tonight but you remember to go to this website please do that um, this is the main exoplanets uh, website where I go to get the latest and greatest information and if you check the number at the bottom of the screen uh, it says 4171 confirmed planets around other stars now that is uh, around 3,092, it says planetary system. So around that number of planets around that number of stars. Uh, so this is more than one planet on average around every single star that, that they've looked at. Now the candidates, that middle number means we found that number using one method, we need to do some follow-up. So that number, 4,171, could go up by, an, by another 5,000 or so. So we have found a ton of planets around other stars. But I wanted to bring up this website too because um, there are some great little news tidbits every now and then, um, has some background information. If you wanna read up some more, I highly recommend that you go to this website. So please, please, please write it down. And if you miss it and you need me to put it in the chat later on, just let me know that and I will gladly do that. Okay, so we, we've talked about how planets form. Um, stars form in big giant clouds of gas and dust. Dusty disks form around those stars. You may get that stuff sticking together. And lo and behold, you've got one or more planets around those stars. I've greatly simplified the process. So I hope you don't mind that I did that. You can have planets of many different sizes from smaller than Earth to bigger than Jupiter. So we've got uh, a wide variety of stuff out there. So how do we find these things? Well, we have to contend with a couple different things. Planets are small compared to their stars. Stars are bright compared to their planets. So we have a few methods that we've got. I'm not gonna go through all the methods because some of them um, 
uh, the, trying to explain it is a little, a little esoteric, but um, I wanted to do the straightforward methods the most, but the most, one of them, one of the methods is um, a method that has been used to find the vast majority of the planets that we found. So I wanted to concentrate on that one. All right. So we can actually take a few handfuls of pictures directly of planets. Now I want to stop screen sharing for just a sec. Um, so um, Christina, can they see, can you see uh, my video? Can they see my video? Yes. Excellent. Good. All right. Because I want to do a little demo. Um, and actually, if we were together at the library, it would be a little harder to do this demo. So the fact that we're at home means I can do something kind of cool. All right, so why is it hard to find planets? So you can see me, I've got a very bright flashlight. I'm gonna shine this flashlight directly at the camera. All right, it is actually, I'm gonna turn the light off in the room just a little bit, so forgive me. All right, and I'm going to close the blinds. Okay, there we go. All right, and of course the camera compensates, but I'm going to shine a bright light. It is really hard to kind of see what's directly around the, um, uh, the flashlight. And that's the problem. If the planet, so if you imagine that my finger, the tip of my finger is a planet, I'm not even touching the flashlight. And you can see that, that my finger, that planet is lost in the glare of, from that star. So one thing that we can do is we can block the light from that star. There are ways to do that. And so I'll, I'll show you a planet that's been found using that method. Then another method is called transit. And so uh, first method is block the light from the star and then you can kind of see what's directly around it, right? So I had for, for um, the, what I was just uh, showing you, my finger was about, oh, about half an inch away from the flashlight. But again, you could hardly see it. So the other method is called transit. And um, here we go. Here's to explain transit. All right, so you've got the light from the star. You are on Earth. You are a scientist on Earth, and this is your telescope, okay? You are, you are studying this star right here. If a planet happens to be in the right plane, meaning in the same plane, imagine plane is piece of paper, in the same plane as you, if that planet passes between you and the star, you're going to see the star's light dim a little bit. Now, I'm over-exaggerating. This would be an eclipse, all right? That is an eclipse. You've got a distant star, you've got, uh, or you've got a, like our sun and our moon passes between us and, and our sun, that's an eclipse. This is not a transit. It, a transit is, you've got a bright star and a teeny tiny little planet, one of our cat toys, by the way, teeny tiny little planet passes in front of it and you can see the light does not go down completely, but it does dim a little bit. Now, again, this is greatly exaggerated. Um, but as that planet passes between us and the star, you can see, see the star's light dim, and then it comes around the star again, and it dims again. And if you time between the dimmings, then you've got the planet's year. If you have the planet's year, you have its distance from the star. How cool is that? Also, if you have the, the uh, amount of dimming, you've got a general sense of the size of the planet. So if we've got a big planet, it's gonna dim the light quite a bit. If you've got a little planet, it's gonna dim the light less. All right, how cool is that? I actually think that is the greatest thing about doing this virtually is um, that I get to show you that. So anyway, I think I saw a question in the chat. Um, let's see, Dimidium is Latin for half uh, referring to the planet's mass of at least half the mass of Jupiter. Well, that's cool. So someone came up with that and had a great explanation for it. Excellent. Have we found star disks that turned into rings? No. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, we have. Um, and it's, it's not exactly rings in the sense um, we found stars with disks where the planet has kind of carved out a space in, in the dusty disk, it's still forming. So it's not completely cleared out of stuff. Um, so the, the stuff is still there, the planet is there, and it's going around and kind of clearing out that, that disk a bit. 
um, before the, the star has a chance to do it itself. Um, so that's a great question. All right. Um, transits of Mercury and Venus viewed from Earth are relatively rare. That is true. Uh, finding exoplanets by watching for a dip in brightness of the parent star requires a transit. Yep. Have we done projections of how many planets might be missing because we are not in the orbital plane? You're exactly right. If you happen to have a star and the planet is orbiting this way, you will not see it. All right. So, but... Um, I can put it in a general sense. The Kepler spacecraft um, studied, uh, I want to say it was around 150,000 stars, and they found, uh, I think, around 3,000 or so, 4,000 planets using Kepler. So those happen to be in the right plane. But yeah, if they're not in the same plane, we're not going to see them. So you then kind of have to extrapolate. So um, you kind of have to use some st statistics to figure out um, how many planets you might be missing. So yeah, we're only going to find a fraction. Um, and yeah, the, the gravitational tug refers to the fact that, I'm not going to turn this on because I don't want to blind you, but um, the, the planet pulls on the star, the star pulls on the planet, the planet moves a lot, the star moves a little, and we can actually see the light from the star change, shift slightly. Um, I'm greatly simplifying the process here. I hope you don't mind. But, um, but anyway, that that is one other way that we have found planets for sure. So great questions, guys. Okay, let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so I'll show you some pictures. All right, we've got this one. Um, I mentioned you can block the light from the star, and here we go. That is a planet right there. Beta Pictoris is the name of the star. Beta Pictoris B is the name of the planet. By the way, um, I have not found an easy explanation for why we do not start with the letter A for finding planets around other stars. Um, I think it's just convention. They kind of started that way and we've kept that. Um, so Beta Pictoris B is the first planet found around Beta Pictoris. Um, but you can see here is a dusty disk and here is the planet. Um, so if you imagine a, an artist's rendition of what it might look like, uh, there are a lot of space artists getting a whole lot of work these days imagining what these planets around other stars could look like. And so this is Beta Pictoris uh, with the dusty disk and the artist's rendition of Beta Pictoris B. All right, now, everything is not as, oops, that's a typo. Everything is not as, sorry about that, it first seems. I stared at that slide for five minutes and did I actually see the typo? No. Anyway, um, I used to include this picture in every single one of my Hubble Space Telescope talks, every single one of these talks, every single one of my uh, armchair tours of the universe talks, because look at this, we've got a star with its light blocked and a circle dot there stuck where the star would be, and then a dusty disk. And look at that, over the course of eight years, we followed this thing right here, which astronomers said, look, it is a planet. We have found it around this star called Fomalhaut. Unfortunately, what we have come to realize in the last few years is there may have been a planet here or something planet-like. And what we found over time was this thing kind of dimmed out a bit. We found that uh, this object, it, it may have been a, a, an, an object actually orbiting this star. However, uh, it collided with something else. We were seeing the expanding debris disk from a, this collision. If this was something like a planet, it is no more. Um, and it probably wasn't like full planet size. We're talking like a, a, a larger object. Um, but we just happened to catch it not too long after it, it had collided. Um, so just imagining a big smash up um, around this star. And so this was not a planet. This was not a picture of a planet around another star. This is this is new information as in, as uh, of a couple months ago. Um, so we thought it was a planet. It is not, and it is actually a a bunch of debris at this point. So all right, 
we do look for transits and this is the method that has been used to find most of the planets um, again I mentioned here's a here's a picture version of what I just demoed um, if you've got a bigger uh, uh, planet passing between us and the star then you've got more light dimmed out if you've got a little planet uh, or it's farther away you've got less light dimmed out and we see this in our own solar system when we look at Mercury and Venus. Occasionally, Mercury and Venus's orbits line up directly with Earth and the Sun. And so we have what is called a transit of Mercury or a transit of Venus. Uh, the next Venus transit, if you missed it in 2012, you gotta wait till the year 2117. And even then, that one is not gonna be visible from Chicago, so you're gonna have to wait till 2125. Uh, please leave a note for your great-grandchildren uh, or, or even uh, even older um, to be able to see that one. We had the transit of Mercury in 2019. Um, it was cloudy and actually it was snowing that morning, so we did not see that one. The next one is uh, visible from this area is in the 2040s. Um, so we have a while to wait for the next Mercury transit, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, astronomers get really excited about squiggly lines on graphs. And so this is the squiggly line that they look for, where you've got a, a, an amount of light and then it dims out and it doesn't go to zero. Notice this graph does not go to zero. This is, a, this is just a tiny dimming and then it goes back up. And again, you look for this to be repeated. If it dims out once and you never see it again, well, that probably wasn't a planet. You need to see it more than once um, to be able to get a sense of how, uh, uh, what, this, what this planet's year is like. And here we go. We've got a larger Jupiter-sized planet is going to cause a bigger dip in the light, and an Earth-sized planet is going to cause a teeny tiny dip. Um, about 1% and I actually had the answer in my slide and I totally forgot. So I'm looking at it right now. About 1% of all the orbits will allow a transit to be visible. So take the number of planets uh, that we found and multiply it by 100 based on the number of stars we've actually stared at, which is about 150,000 or so, uh, if not more. And so then you get a sense that there are a lot of planets out there. So, okay. Before the Kepler spacecraft, this is how many planets we knew of uh, in that in the direction that it was going to stare at. By 2012, um, this is how many we could see. And actually, Kepler lasted longer than than this. Uh, it just became an entire array of little dots all over the picture. Um, so Kepler found a lot of planets. It it, it survived for about four years. Um, on its main planet hunting uh, mission, and then it uh, it morphed into a new planet hunting mission after that. So we got a lot of good life out of the Kepler spacecraft. And we find lots of different sizes. We find gas giants that would be similar to Jupiter or Saturn, even bigger than Jupiter and Saturn sometimes. Neptune-like would be about Neptune or Uranus sized. Super Earths are kind of in between Earth and Neptune in size. Uh, and then you've got Earth size, and actually we found them down to about Mars sized or so. So I want to put this graph in another way. All right, I've actually blocked out some of the information from this graph to make it a little easier to visualize. Over here on this side of the graph, you've got uh, planets that are closer to the star. All right, so everything here orbits in a few days. Everything on this side of the graph that we found uh, is a lot farther from the side from this from the star and orbits in a thousand days or more All right, and these are all compared to earth days by the way um, Anything on the top of the graph is a big planet everything on the bottom of the graph is a little planet Everything close to its star would be a hot planet everything far from the star would be a cold planet and, and so you've got all this amazing array of big giant things that are close to the star that they call hot Jupiters big giant things that are far from the star. So we call them cold gas giants. Why don't we call them cold Jupiters? I don't know. Um, we've got rocky planets. Frontier means uh, weird stuff that we have no idea what it would be like um, because we've never seen anything like that. Lava worlds is rocky planet close to the star. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing for a sec and see if we've got, I think we had a chat question come up. Ah, 
So, well, yes. So, yeah, thanks, Bob. A is the star itself. Um, so I, I just find it fascinating that um, people actually think about the uh, the naming conventions seriously in astronomy, very much so. So thank you for that clarification. Appreciate that. Um, Linda asks, it seems that there's now an explosion of new information about planets. Was there a technological or analytical advance that all of a sudden made this possible? Are we close to having fully utilized our tools now? Oh my gosh, no. Um, <laughs> so the answer to your first question is yes, we finally were able to have um, our instrumentation be precise enough that we could see, um, in, in one case, we could see the shift in light from the star. That was the type of planet that was found first. We saw the gravitational tug of the planet on the star, which causes the star's light to kind of shift a little bit. Our, our technological tools finally got good enough for that. As far as um, transits and, and just finding literally thousands of planets, we finally got the instrumentation to be precise enough that we could take the pictures fast enough and we can see the teeny tiny dips in, in light from, from the planet passing between the stars. So we just needed our tools to be good enough. The ideas for this existed decades ago, but we didn't have the technological capability in order to make all this happen. So yeah, it was, it was definitely our, our technology finally caught up to the brains who are thinking about how to do this. So are we close to having fully utilized our tools? No, uh, they're always getting better. And that's because um, we can notice smaller and smaller dips. That means smaller and smaller planets. Um, so we found them down to about Mars size, but obviously there are objects out there smaller than Mars. Um, if, if our own solar system is any uh, indication. We also would love to find moons around planets. Those are called exomoons. We haven't found one yet. Um, so uh, does NASA give up on a planet that has a year longer than a thousand days? No, that you're running into the lifetime of the spacecraft at that point. So um, they don't give up. It's that Kepler uh, could only last to that precision degree. It only lasted about four years, uh, which is just over a thousand days or so. So no, it's not that they gave up. It's that uh, the spacecraft didn't last long enough to be able to take those precise measurements. Its mission carried on. Um, but it wasn't able to keep staring at the same spot in the sky. So at that point, you also run into the fact that telescope time is very precious. And so uh, you don't have spacecraft or you don't have telescopes, especially on the ground, just staring at stars. Um, they just don't have the, the time to be able to do that. So um, that's why spacecraft missions like TESS now is, is able to, to take a look at um, uh, at stars, and then we're going to follow that on with other spacecraft uh, over the next few years. So anyway, it's not through lack of uh, will in order to, to look for these. It's a lack of spacecraft um, at that point. So excellent, excellent question. Okay. Um, oh, we did have a question that got put into the Q&A. Do me a favor. Um, I see it, but do me a favor. Keep the questions in the chat so that they're all in one spot. Webinar gives you the opportunity to do both, but that's how we don't have to keep looking back and forth. Uh, could the dimming of the light be a way to solve the three-body problem, assuming one of them is a light source? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. So if you could clarify what you mean by what you, what you want to know by that question, I would love to be able to try to answer it. Um, so while you do that, I'm going to uh, share my screen a little bit more. So go ahead and clarify the question in the chat and we'll get back to it in the next break. Okay. All right. Okay. What sizes are we finding? Lots of Neptune size. Lots of bigger than Earth or uh, bigger than Earth, smaller than Neptune size. Lots of Earth size. Not as many Jupiter size, um, which makes sense though. Think about our own solar system. We've got four uh, that, are, that are small and rocky. We've got two that are big and gassy squishy. Uh, then you've got Uranus and Neptune. So uh, Neptune is, Uranus and Neptune are what we call ice giants, but um, if you think of our own solar system, kind of makes sense that uh, that you might not find as many Jupiter size. Um, you need them to to be to to gather up lots of material in their solar systems, and just 
they just don't have a chance to do that sometimes. Okay, let's get to the really weird ones. We think about our own solar system. Oh, we are so not weird compared to some of these other, other places. First thing we want to talk about is um, this star right here. This is called Proxima Centauri. And this is a size comparison of different stars. Here's our sun right here. All right, the star Sirius A, so the brightest star in our wintertime sky or in our nighttime sky is Sirius A. Here's our sun. And little tiny Proxima, which is not too much bigger than the planet Jupiter. By the way, Jupiter is not a failed star. It was never massive enough to, to be a star, but Proxima is a little bit bigger than Jupiter. It is the closest star to us. It's about four light years away. And um, if you have on the left side of the graph, we've got our sun and then this dotted line indicates Mercury's orbit. See that little tiny little bitty dot? You probably can't if you're watching this on your phone, but just suffice it to say the size of the tip of my arrow there is uh, Proxima Centauri. And then Proxima B, that dotted line, you can see it's a lot closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun, but it's, it's a lot smaller star and it's a lot cooler. Um, so it can be closer. It is within uh, Proxima's habitable zone, which is kind of cool. Um, or I should say kind of Goldilocks, sorry, kind of neat. Um, if you imagine what it could look like from uh, that system, here you go. Here's, here's what the surface of uh, Proxima Centauri B could look like. We don't know for certain if it does look like this, but uh, the little dots off in the distance, you've got Alpha Centauri, you might have heard of that star, um, and there's Beta Centauri, I think, and so then we've got um, we've got some other, uh, uh, some uh, several stars in this system, so that is the closest planet outside of our own solar system. This one is an artist's rendition, it's called Ross 128. This is likely to be rocky. It's about, has about the same amount of stuff in it that Earth does. It's um, not too far away. It's the second nearest known terrestrial planet. Um, so this is, um, it's something that is, it's neat to find these planets, but um, we want to do better than that. We want to talk about some, some other interesting things. How about a planet? Uh, this is a, a map of the planet. This is the map of a surface of the planet. Uh, the star is called, or sorry, the um, uh, planet is called HD 189733b. It doesn't have a fancy name yet, so if you're wondering where that comes from, that comes from, comes from the name of the star, HD 189733, and so the planet's name is HD 189733b. Um, but this is a hot Jupiter. They have made a temperature map of this planet. How neat is that, right? We actually have a temperature map of this planet. You can see there's a hot spot um, on this planet, and it's not all at the same temperature. Um, so that's about all we all we can do. But this is um, uh, this is a planet where the the cool side, the dark side of the planet, is about 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. The sunlit side is about 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this means there are probably some ferocious winds um, moving the heat from one side of the planet to the other. The winds in the, in the atmosphere of this planet are probably blowing about 6,000 miles an hour. Be glad we're not here. <laughs> so what else do we have? This is the planet that is most like Earth. Look at this. It's a little bit bigger than Earth. Its star is a little bit bigger than our sun. Um, its year is only a tiny bit longer than ours. This could be the most Earth-type Earth planet that's out there. We don't know if it's Earth-like, um, but Kepler-452b is at least really interesting, okay? So, how about a, a planet that is, is around a star that's one of the oldest out there. This star is 11.2 billion years old, and it has at least five Earth-sized planets going around it. Think of how old these planets are. For comparison, our Earth is about five, or about four and a half billion years old. So the, the star and these planets 
assuming the planets formed at the same or just slightly after the star did, which is how stars and planets form, these planets are probably close to 11 billion years old. Can you imagine? That would be a, an amazing place to, uh, to study. Here we've got a solar system called TRAPPIST-1 that, that's for the name of the telescope, uh, seven planets in that solar system. This now starts to look like our own solar system, doesn't it? So not just one or two planets, we have seven. And they're each around Earth-sized or a little smaller. Um, if you could imagine what it could look like on the surface of one of these planets, that's relatively close to the star and you can see the other planets. These aren't moons, the, well, it could have moons, but these are other planets in that same system. How awesome would that be? Really interesting solar system there. And for all you Star Wars fans, don't worry, I've got something for you. This is uh, Kepler 16b. This is a planet that or orbits a pair of stars. So just like Luke Skywalker's home planet of Tatooine, we have a Tatooine type planet out there. So this is a two star system with a planet that essentially orbits both. So um, the, unfortunately, the prospects for life on this planet are pretty low. Um, the, the surface temperature of this planet is probably close to that of dry ice. Uh, <laughs> dry ice is, uh, um, or more than 100 degrees below zero. So yeah, probably not much living there. But how about this one? Kepler 186f. All right. This star, Kepler 186, is a very red colored star. Um, and so therefore, if there could be life here, which we don't know if it is, if there is any, the plant life could be red as well. Think about that. We have a yellow green star, our, our sun. What color is our plant life? Yellow green. We have a reddish colored star. What color would the plant life be? Maybe reddish. So anyway, something neat to think about. What, what would the life look like uh, as you're there around uh, another star? This one is um, a planet, uh, Kepler 7b. It is 50% larger than Jupiter, but it has half Jupiter's mass. It has the same density as styrofoam. This planet would float if you put it in a big enough bathtub. To be fair, Saturn would too. Um, but still, this is a planet bigger than Jupiter that could float in a big enough bathtub. So um, it doesn't mean it's made of styrofoam. It is just, it's got the density of styrofoam. So anyway. We've got planets that we think have uh, lava uh, all over their surfaces. Um, if, they're, if they're close enough to their star, then their surfaces are probably very melty. Um, the hottest side of this particular one uh, is nearly 4,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The cooler side is 2,060 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so there may be uh, lava on this surface, or it could be an atmosphere that is thicker than Earth's. Um, so, wow, an amazing place to think about. Could be lava on the surface, uh, or could have an atmosphere that is that is a lot more dense than our own planet. Think Venus. Um, Venus has an atmosphere that is a lot more dense. Uh, for any ring fans out there, we've got a planet J1407b. Um, that has a, a ring system 200 times larger than that of Saturn. Uh, they, it probably has at least 30 big rings and it creates a disk um, uh, that is so wide. So actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing because I want to uh, show you guys a demo of what they did. So in order to see the ring system of this particular planet, um, so they, as the planet, I'm going to dim out the flashlight a little bit here. Um, as the planet passed between us and the star, they knew it was going to dim. They knew it was there. They knew it was going to dim the light. But before it even got there, it started dimming the light. And they could kind of see the light flickering a little bit, flicker, 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 and then it passed. And then flicker, 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 and then nothing. This thing has a giant ring system, and it took two months for that ring system to completely pass so that we could get a sense of the size of those rings. That is an amazingly 
big ring system. Okay, so let me go back to the chat real quick. Uh, if we say that one of the bodies is a star and we know that the light level of it, yep, then we can use the light levels changes in a way, perhaps analyzing if there is a pattern in the changes. Uh, and then we can provide a definite way to define the movement of each body. Absolutely. That's exactly how we find information about the mass of uh, these planets. Um, and so we can figure out, we can use various ways of taking, uh, figuring out the, taking the, the, the star and the planet and figuring out how long it takes, how fast it goes, how far it is. And you can use other methods then to figure out the mass of the planet and and so that is definitely something that can be done so yes not just a three body problem we've done this with that seven planet solar system too so a seven eight body problem actually so um all right does mars fall into the goldilocks zone um i believe mars is just outside the goldilocks zone right now um however that Goldilocks zone is kind of misleading because what if the conditions weren't habitable on the surface of the planet? What if they're habitable under the surface of the planet? Do you have to then expand out your Goldilocks zone? How about this? We know that life probably can't live in the atmosphere of Jupiter, but what if one of Jupiter's moons had life on it in some way. Um, there's a there's a moon of Jupiter called Europa. And Europa has an icy crusty surface. And underneath that ice is a lot of water, um, a, a salty ocean. Could there be life in that salty ocean? If the if the water's liquid, it has to be warm enough to be liquid, right? So you've greatly expanded out your Goldilocks zone. What if on Venus, you, you're under the surface pretty far, the surface is pretty nasty, but what if under the surface you have uh, conditions a lot more temperate? Could that expand out your habitable zone? So yeah, it, it, it isn't that Mars isn't in the Goldilocks zone. Maybe our definition of the Goldilocks zone isn't good enough. And we have to really think about the conditions that these planets are in. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Bob. All these worlds are yours except Europa. Attempt no landings there. That is uh, from the book 2010. If you have not read it, when the, when the library is available, uh, definitely check out that book um, and you'll see what we mean by that. Um, so yeah, that is one of my favorite authors for sure. Okay, so just a few more slides and we are almost done. So let me go back. This is a planet. It, it is colored blue because we know its color is blue. Blue on our planet tends to mean water. Blue on this planet means uh, the daytime temperature uh, nearly 2000 degrees Fahrenheit and this planet probably rains glass. Uh, what that means is glass is mostly silica, melted silica in the atmosphere of this planet in 45 100 mile an hour winds. This planet is cobalt blue, but it's due to the glass droplets, the silica droplets, the melted silica that's in the atmosphere of this planet. And so I've already given you more than nine of, of these weird, amazing worlds. Think of how uh, rather humdrum our own solar system looks when we take a look at some of these strange, strange places. This one is WASP 12b. Uh, WASP refers to the telescope. It is a planet that orbits so close to its star that it's being torn apart by the star. Uh, it orbits its star in just over a day. So uh, just over an Earth day. What that means is by about midnight tomorrow night, uh, this planet will have orbited its star once. It is the heat of the star that is stripping away and, and uh, stripping away the planet's atmosphere. In about 10 million years, this planet could be completely consumed by this star. Um, it's about two times the size of Jupiter. And the temperature on this planet is about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the gravity from the star is stretching the shape of this planet into an egg shape. So it's not round, it's, it's, it's more of an oval shape. Plus, this is one of the absolute 
darkest worlds we have ever seen. Take the darkest material you've ever seen in person, and this planet is even darker than that. Um, so it is just an incredibly strange place. All right. Now, if you want to get into hunting for planets around other stars, you can do this. Go to planethunters.org. This is a citizen science project uh, through the Zooniverse uh, program, citizen science program. And you will be shown a, a selection of data from one of these telescopes, and you can comb through. There have been several Planet Hunters volunteers that have found planets within the data. This is not just combing through and looking at the same data that scientists have been looking at for, for 50 years. This is data from these telescopes that, that need to be gone through. And so uh, you can get involved. So go to planethunters.org and they'll teach you how to go through the data. It's not hard. Um, and you can search for planets around other stars as well. NASA also has a visualization tool. It's called Eyes on Exoplanets. And you can just search for Eyes on Exoplanets. And you can get the catalog of these planets. And they update it with the information about the planet and artist's rendition of the planet. Again, these are all artist renditions. We do not have pictures of these. Um, but uh, we have general maps. I showed you that temperature map, but that is nowhere near an actual map of the surface of, of that particular world. But you can learn an awful lot about these. So um, you can go to exoplanets.nasa.gov. You can go to uh, planethunters.org. You can go to Eyes on Exoplanets. And um, you can just dive right into the amazing wacky world of planets around other stars. Last couple slides. Um, uh, it was about uh, a couple years ago, we had a, a visitor from another solar system into our solar system. It was called, um, oh, they kind of called it a, an asteroid. It was given a name, Oumuamua, and it's about a quarter mile long and about 10 times as long as it is wide. At least that's what the data suggest. And um, it was uh, coming into our solar system too fast to be something that started within our own solar system. So this is from another solar system. Um, and it, it came in and it went back out. We don't know which solar system it was from because unfortunately in the time it takes to get from one solar system to another, uh, the solar systems move. And so it's, it's kind of hard to figure out where this thing might have come from. But this is definitely not from our solar system. But Unfortunately, it wasn't around long enough for us to send a spacecraft to it. Um, we're talking a matter of, uh, of months in our, in our relative vicinity. Um, but still, now that we have seen one, we now know what to look for. And about a year ago, they found this, which is called Comet Borisov. Borisov was the name of the person who found this comet. This is not a comet from our solar system. Again, going way too fast to have started off here. And so this is a comet from another solar system. So um, that's pretty neat. And then finally, um, when we do finally find something that we think could be Earth-like, what are we going to search for? How do we know what it could be? Well, there was a, um, a, a spacecraft that was repurposed a few years ago. And... Um, uh, it was a NASA mission called Deep Impact, and I'm going to stop sharing so you can see me and not staring at the slide. Um, keep, keep this little set of boxes in mind, though, because I'm going to refer to that in just a sec. Um, and so there was a spacecraft called Deep Impact that did its job. It still had a spacecraft with a camera on it that still worked. And so they decided to send it away from Earth, and it did a few other things. So at one point, it turned back and looked at Earth and essentially took a picture just a few pixels wide. So that was the actual picture that Deep Impact took of Earth. And so when we find a planet that we might be able to, to get a picture of, um, we can take a look at what our planet looks like with life on it, with water on it, and all sorts of stuff, only a few pixels wide. So that when we find another planet that might only show up a few pixels wide around another star, um, then we have something to compare it to. So uh, there was, they were very purposeful in taking that picture of our own planet. So I'm going to check the chat. 
Uh, I saw Rocky Planet and pictured Stallone doing a workout montage. For a second there, Sid, I thought it was going to be a Rocky and Bowling Hill quote. I really did. So <laughs> Bob says, if Kepler were around a faraway star looking back at our own solar system, would it find any planets? Um, yeah, it would. It would depend on how far uh, then how far away Kepler was, and then also if it was it within the plane of of our solar system. But yeah, our our sun uh, would dim out if you're in the right plane. Um, yeah, you could absolutely find uh, uh, our planets around our star, which is kind of neat. Is there another solar system looking at us trying to find the same thing? Hmm. Anyway, if you have any other questions, um, let me know. I'll, I'll wait a few more seconds uh, for the chat. This is um, one of my favorite topics because it just, it changes all the time. Um, that number on exoplanets, oh, it reminds me, I was going to put the websites in the, in the chat. So exoplanets, and I have to speak as I type because, there we go, exoplanets.nasa.gov, and then planethunters.org, and eyes on exoplanets. Eyes on exoplanets is not the website, um, but you can just search for, actually, just search for NASA. Um, eyes, whoops. Exoplanets. I don't know if you're like me, but I can't type, type and talk at the same time. Um, so you can search just NASA eyes on exoplanets. It'll have to be, you'll have to do a, a download a little of a little widget to your computer, um, but that'll, that will work. Um, so just search for NASA eyes on exoplanets. I think it's a lot longer website than that. Uh, they may also have it linked from the exoplanets.nasa.gov site. Um, so you may want to check that. So any other questions before we uh, wrap up for tonight? So I'm going to keep uh, stalling and waiting and see if you have any more questions. So I will just keep blathering on a little bit. Um, hey, hey, Michelle, can you hey. hear me? Yeah, I right. Oh, I have a quick uh, just announcement to everyone who's uh, here. I'm going to send a survey afterwards. So please go ahead and fill that out. It really helps us determine what virtual programs you guys want. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Oh, no problem. And please do fill that out. Don't just toss it away in your, in your email trash. Fill that out because libraries are uh, very much trying to figure out this brave new world of online programming because it may be a while before we can be together in person. Um, in some cases, it might be uh, later in phase four. Sometimes it might be in phase five before we might be able to, to have in-person programs. So trying to figure out what kinds of programs you like, how long uh, the programs are, the topics. Um, uh, do, you, do you like the piano programs and the, and the cooking programs and all that kind of stuff? So there it is, the Eyes on Exoplanets. Thank you, Sid. Um, and uh, Sid just put the, uh, the Eyes on Exoplanets link in the chat. So thank you for doing that. Linda says, this was great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, again, I, I wish you all the best. Stay safe. Uh, be well. Um, hang tight, everyone. We'll get through this. And uh, I hope to see you at the Adler sometime, possibly by early 2022. Um, so we're prepared to be closed that long if necessary. Because again, we want to keep everybody safe. Um, so thank you so much. Make Pluto Planet again. Actually, Emil, if, if I'm, again, the names that show up, I have to assume those are your names. So uh, forgive me if it's not your name, but that's the name that shows up. Um, you absolutely can call Pluto a planet. There is only one organization on this planet that has not called Pluto a planet or has named Pluto a dwarf planet. That is the International Astronomical Union. Um, they have a definition whereby planet Pluto does not meet all aspects of the definition. That does not mean that they couldn't go back and change the definition because it's kind of a bad definition. Um, uh, it was not meant to exclude Pluto. It was meant to put a definition together for the word planet, which we didn't have before. Um, unfortunately, by the definition, if you stuck Earth out where Pluto is now, Earth would not meet the definition of the word planet. That tells me that it's not a great definition. I won't go into the whole uh, 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 details about that. That's for another talk. But um, 
you absolutely can call Pluto a planet. There's no treaty that anybody has signed with the International Astronomical Union that says we must follow what they say. Um, and not only that, the IAU is not all astronomers on this planet. So it's only a, a handful of them. So, um, hey, call Pluto a planet. I agree. So there we go. Yeah, we may sue. Yeah, Jupiter hasn't cleared its orbit either. You're exactly right. Uh, you're exactly right, Bob. And um, we have another one that says we may soon find that planet nine. And what that refers to is there may be an object well past the orbit of Pluto uh, that might exist. Uh, and if it's there, they think it's about the size of Neptune. If that's true, that could be a ninth planet. Well, 10th. Um, and so, yeah, there are teams of scientists looking for it right now, uh, it, at least two that, that I know of. So uh, it's really hard to find. It is really far away. It is not an easy job to search for it. We may not ever find it, uh, but they are looking for it. So, yeah, so keep, keep your ears open for uh, any news on that in the next few years. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Stay cool, stay safe, be well. We'll be together soon. And uh, I'll stay on a few more seconds. So if you have any other questions you want to throw in, uh, thanks a lot. But if you want to leave, thank you so much. Hope to see you soon.